Welcome everyone. This is Seal Strauss with the, uh, the Minnesota Floodplain Program and I'll be presenting with James Sink is going to be helping me. James, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Sink. I am the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA Region 5. So uh, any insurance questions you might have that, that SEAL can't, ha can't answer, I'm, I'm happy to give a hand with them. Appreciate James being able to help us out today. Gary Bennett is a co-worker in the floodplain program who will be helping to watch the chat and making sure some of the logistics are, are going smoothly for us today. And we'll be asking the attendees to stay muted for most of the presentation at the end. Uh, we'll stay on as long as there's people asking questions. We'll stop the recording at the end of the more formal presentation part. If there's questions you want to ask at the end, if there's questions that are especially more time sensitive, if you could be putting them into the chat and we'll try to address those as we go here before we get too far, too much further in the uh, presentation. So talking about flood insurance basics, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the background here on you know, who are participating communities, review some terms, talk about the basics of flood insurance. And I do have quite a few slides getting into more details on the premiums and how they're determined. We may go through those pretty quickly because uh, most folks probably don't want to get into all the weeds there, but uh, I've got them there in case we do want to talk about some of those factors a bit more. And as noted here on the slide, thanks to FEMA for many of the slides that I'm using and graphics, other pieces of information that are in the slides that are, we're showing today. And I did want to make a plug for FEMA Region 5 does do a monthly training. And in June, the topic's going to be about insurance. And James was mentioning that he's going to be getting his upcoming trainings together here pretty soon. And we'll be providing those dates and registration information. So starting with where this fits into the big picture nationally. The National Flood Insurance Program, it's got insurance in the name of it, but it is a program that covers actually different aspects of protecting ourselves during floods or from floods. It's created in 1968 by Congress, and it is officially a voluntary program. Communities choose to get into the, enroll in the program, if they enroll in the program, as we'll talk later, then anyone in their community is able to get flood insurance and they commit to regulating the areas within their floodplain, their mapped floodplain areas and enforcing their regulations and helping to pe keep the people in their community safer from flooding. The uh, FEMA does refer to it as the three-legged stool, that one of the legs of the stool is that floodplain management aspect. There's federal regulations. We also have state regulations. And those are administered at the local level by wh whoever the zoning authority is in the state. The Another leg of the stool is identifying that risk, and that's the mapping that we do. And we've had other trainings about mapping and the ongoing efforts to get better and more accurate mapping in the state. But the third component is flood insurance. That it, in the past, it was really hard for insurers to, to stay solvent because they tend to have their policies clustered in an area. You'd have a big flood and a good portion of their, their book, a good portion of their policies were, were affected by one event. So in 1968, it did set up the, the nationally backed program that we have now and able to spread that risk and have that available to communities and to, to residents going forward here. Uh, this, this picture here I like throwing into the beginning of our presentation. This is a banner that was uh, in St. Paul. Back about 20 years ago, there was a big development on the Mississippi River, and uh, 
that it followed all the correct rules, but it was it was a big development right next to the river. And this is some comment by the neighbors who were up on the bluff above where that development was going in. But I just enjoy that picture. So I want to start off with a few myths, and we'll get into more details on many of these as we go on in the hour here. But this is uh, one of the FEMA slides, and they have a nice summary of common things that are myths. They're, they're not true. And uh, the first of those that you can't buy flood insurance if your property has been flooded before. And that is not true, that there are, the, the flood insurance continues to be available. It doesn't matter if you've had previous floods in the past. And that you can't buy flood insurance if you live in a high risk flood zone, which is absolutely not true. That's exactly the areas where we most want to make sure people know that they can buy flood insurance. Or on the flip side, many people are told that they can't buy flood insurance because they're not in the high risk area. And I can vouch for that. When I took this job in the floodplain program over 20 years ago, I checked with my own local agent and said, well, what, what would the premium be for me to get flood insurance? And he said, you don't live in a flood zone, you can't get flood insurance. So I know that that was a prevalent problem and continues to be a prevalent problem around the state. And so we want you to be aware that you can buy flood insurance anywhere in the community. You don't have to be in that mapped area, but your community does need to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, another myth is gets to the what is the cost of recovery? Oh, if I get flooded, it's not a big deal. It's It doesn't cost that much to recover. And actually, it can be quite expensive. And in the slides, which we will send out PDFs of the slides so you can click on those links that we've got throughout the presentation. But uh, FEMA's got a nice cost of flood tool that is a, a good resource to look at what the costs of flooding are. And I mentioned you can only buy flood insurance if you live in a floodplain, which uh, I mentioned already here. Another myth is that people think their homeowner's insurance covers flooding, and it does not. The other thing is flood insurance being available only to homeowners. And as we'll see in some of the details in the slides later, it is available to renters. And unfortunately, the, the renters, population is very underrepresented in terms of having flood insurance policies. There's not too many of the content only policies. And that's one of those messages that's difficult to get out there. And another one that we'll again get into some more detail is I don't need flood insurance because FEMA is going to come in and hand out all kinds of money if there's a disaster. And we'll talk about that in more depth that that is not the case. So who can buy flood insurance? As I've already hinted, anyone who is living in a community, the, the properties in the community, where the community participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. And all zones, you know, the, the high hazard zones and the lower risk zones. And a reminder that the homeowner's hazard insurance rarely covers flooding damage. So how do I know if I'm in the flood insurance program? Well, in Minnesota, most communities are in the program. Over 96% of the population lives in a community that participates. If you don't know if your community participates, FEMA's got something called the Community Status Book. And this is what the lenders will use to, to check if um, someone's and the agents will use to see if a community's in the program. It's got communities listed alphabetically and shows the county they're in. And then in another section here, it shows the date of the most recent current effective map and the date that they got into the program that they enrolled. And this NSFHA and the E, you might say, well, what's that about? If you look at the legend that's in the last page of the community status book, you'll see that NSFHA stands for No Special Flood Hazard Area. And so there's no mapped FEMA high hazard areas in that community. 
So the whole and the whole community is considered the lower risk zone or zone C, according to this. The E is they're in the emergency program, and I won't get into a lot of detail about what that is, but it's generally small communities that have no map or a very old type of map, and that makes a difference for some of the coverage that they can get that we'll mention a bit later. Another thing on this community status book talks about CRS and the discounts that if your community is in CRS, and that is a, a program FEMA offers where the community, they, they basically document that they're doing better stuff for flood reduction and protection in their community, that they've got higher standards, they've got a bigger percentage of open space in the community, they do a good job of getting communications out, and the, the more things that they do, the more points they get, the more points they get, the better their class. And oops, the better their class, the better the percentage of a discount for anybody in their community that um, gets a flood insurance policy. Previously, it, that policy discount only uh, applied to buildings within those high hazard areas, but now with the more recent way of doing the uh, the uh, premiums, the uh, risk rating 2.0 that we'll get into a bit more, that discount now applies to all the policies in a community. So I do think we'll be seeing more of our communities interested in the community rating system that have many of the policies that used to be the policies that were called the preferred risk policies or those policies that are outside the mapped areas. So we'll have a couple more slides about that later. At the end of that document, it does list the communities that do not participate in the program and that have mapped flood risk. So 80 some communities in Minnesota, but we also have a, a couple hundred more communities that aren't on this list because they don't participate and they haven't been mapped. They haven't got any high risk mapped areas that FEMA's identified. So they also would not be able to get flood insurance in those communities. Then we get into the question of, okay, so anybody can choose to get flood insurance in my community since we're participating, but who has to get insurance? Where's flood insurance mandatory? And basically we're looking at the high hazard areas, the A zones, or if you have V zones, which right now we don't have any V zones, coastal zones in Minnesota, but we will in the future in St. Louis County. Um, but if your building is in the A zone or touching that area, then, and you have a federally backed loan, so most types of mortgages, most types of secured loans where um, they're an FDIC insured bank. They they have they trade on the secondary market, the Freddie, Fannie, all those kinds of things. So most types of mortgages and loans are going to be federally backed um, situations where the lender must require flood insurance if that building is in or touching the flood. On the older maps, that higher flood risk area is that darker shaded area. Now. The medium risk area is on there in some areas of the state. The 500 year floodplain, in most cases, that will be. That is the buildings that are in that medium risk or low risk areas. They don't have mandatory insurance, but a lender does have the prerogative to require flood insurance as part of their, their loan um, approval. Since they're, they're taking on the risk of, of uh, backing up that building, uh, paying, providing that that uh, loan, they do have that choice, but it's not the federal mandate to have that. And just a reminder that the flood risk area is that 1% annual Chatton's flood area, commonly called the 100 year, but we've got different terms. The, the area below the base flood elevation in Minnesota law, they talks about the regional flood.
when we're talking about flood insurance and loans, they usually call it the special flood hazard area. As I mentioned on that community status book, the no special flood hazard area or the NSFHA is uh, again related to loans and, and, and that side of the flood insurance. But in general, we call it the high flood risk area. So in this example, this pinkish area is the FEMA mapped area. So this person who is clearly on a high spot, but the lender must require them to get flood insurance unless they go through a process. We'll just briefly mention here getting a letter of map amendment, but the lender has no choice. They can say, I know it's high, but they have to require the flood insurance if that building is in or touching the floodplain. On the flip side, this building here we can see is actually low and they're not going to have mandatory flood insurance based on the current map, but when that area gets more accurately mapped, they will be shown in the area where flood insurance is mandatory. And just a reminder, those of you in Minnesota that your ordinance based on state law says that you're regulating that area adjacent to the floodplain when it's below the base flood elevation. And with the current LIDAR and two-foot two contours that we've got readily available now, it's much easier to see those situations than in the past. But let's say here's an example where we've got the floodplain and some parcels here shown. So you know, what if the building here was looked at by a lender? Would they be a mandatory flood insurance situation and their building is not touching the floodplain. In fact, their whole parcel is not touching the floodplain. So it would not be mandatory based on, on the federal requirements. And sometimes lenders will tell people that they're required to get flood insurance because they'll do some kind of a buffer when they're doing, they're having their computers look to see if the buildings are in the floodplain or not. Uh, but this is a situation where you can show the lender um, the, the official map and say, you know, it's out as shown on the official map. Another example would be this one where the building's not actually in there, but it clips the parcel. And like Cole was bringing up, uh, you know, it's not that the parcels in the floodplain doesn't trigger the mandatory flood insurance. If It's if the building is in there. That's one where they may be told that they have to get flood insurance, but it's not actually mandatory. They can show a better map that the building's actually out, out as shown. But this building is what we see pretty often where people aren't happy. They're told that they have to get flood insurance. And absolutely, that lender is correct to say that they have to get flood insurance because that flood plane is nicking that building. And the only way for them to be able to get out of it is if they're actually high, then they can go through a letter of map change process. They can get a letter of map amendment and provide information showing that they're actually high. Um, and they get a, a formal document from FEMA that says, we've evaluated this extra data you gave us we see you're actually high, you're officially considered zone X or out of the mandatory purchase area for flood insurance. And this is a, a FEMA slide that's got a lot of nice detail. We're not gonna get into any more detail today, but point out that we do have more about map appeals and amendments on the DNR site at this link. And we've done a couple of our trainings on the map basics, we have a, at the end, we probably have about 15 minutes where we get into more detail on letters of map amendments and related things. And we did a, a training last year with uh, Suzanne Juani and I where we got into a lot more detail about, we spent the whole hour talking about letters of map change if you want to know more. So getting back to some of the flood insurance basics here, the coverage limits, for the program, if you're in the regular program, is for residential buildings, 250,000 for the building side there, up to 100,000 for contents, and then it includes 
uh, 30 th up to $30,000 for something called the increased cost of compliance. And we won't get into a lot of detail about ICC today, but I'll want to note that that's basically about if a building with flood insurance is substantially damaged due to flooding and the local official documents that, then that homeowner, that policy owner can take that letter that says they were substantially damaged, work with their their adjuster, their their insurance folks in making the claim, and they can get up to $30,000 for that increased cost because they need to elevate their building or move it to another part of their, their lot. Because if they're substantially damaged, your ordinance says that they have to be built in compliance. They have to have their lowest floor at the correct elevation. And whereas if, if they're a grandfathered building, they've been allowed to continue to exist without elevating the building. But once they're substantially damaged, they do have to elevate that building. And this is recognizing that there's an additional cost to raise that building up a bit or to move it to a different part of the lot. And that ICC money can be used to elevate or to move or to demolish, or if it's a non-residential building where flood proofing is allowed, to do some flood proofing there to bring the building into compliance. Non-residential buildings, up to 500,000 in building coverage, 500,000 in contents coverage, and that same increased cost compliance option. Now, I mentioned the emergency program. There's not many communities that are that in Minnesota. They have pretty limited amounts of coverage that they can get. And if you're working with a community that's um, in the emergency program, we can talk to you about some of the other limitations more directly. This is a, a FEMA slide that's got a little bit more detail. Uh, the only things I'll add in here is a reminder that uh, there, for the residential buildings, that vacation and secondary homes are eligible for coverage. And again, talking about that, you can get contents only coverage if you're a renter. And that that is, again, one of the areas where we're, we see people are really under uh, protected when it comes to underinsured. And getting the word out to renters is a lot tougher for them to even realize that they're in the higher risk zone. And then this RCBAP is more about uh, condos. And if you've got questions about condos, James is the guy that you want to talk to. I know I'm in over my head when we get into talking about the details for this. So if you've got a question, we could maybe bring asset at the end. Waiting periods. So you buy a new house, um, you've got a loan when you're closing, the flood insurance, you have to get flood insurance or you choose to get flood insurance and that policy is effective immediately as soon as you're closing. Normally, it would be a 30-day waiting period. If you choose to go buy a policy, it's not effective immediately. And part of this goes back to years ago, it used to be that there was only a five-day waiting period and in the like the 93 flood, FEMA found that a lot of people on the big rivers, we had pretty good forecasting. They knew that they were going to get flooded next week. So a bunch of people ran out, got policies. Um, they had them for five days. Then they got flooded. They made a claim and then they dropped their policy. And too many people were trying to time the market. And so Congress did have some law changes, I think that was in 94, but it was, it's was it been a while now. And they said, okay, you're gonna have to wait 30 days. You can't play this game of going and buying a policy only five days before the flood. Even the best forecasters, we don't know for sure that it's gonna flood 30 days out. Then the other situation where we only have a one day waiting period is if you've just gotten new maps in your county or your community. And for, especially for those buildings that are newly shown as at higher risk. And again, we didn't put them in the floodplain. We didn't make them at risk by showing on the map that they are at risk, but the risk 
are more accurately identified on the maps as we update them and we're using better elevation data to draw the boundaries. So there are people who are shown in the floodplain now that were not shown in the floodplain before because we didn't have the good technical information we have now for, for drawing those map boundaries. Um, there's also a discount, a newly mapped discount for that person who was not mapped on the previous map and is mapped now. It's not a huge amount of a discount. I think it's 70% on the first 35,000 of the building coverage, but it helps. And there's some a wildfire exemption and that hasn't come up in Minnesota, so I didn't put the details here. It's a very lengthy list of criteria, but if that does come up, we'll, we'll definitely get James to help us get word out on what the issues are that people need to think about for those situations. So what's a flood when it comes to making a claim for having been flooded? And I, I liked this cartoon. Yes, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And yes, your boat landed on the top of a mountain, but that's not how we define a flood. And I do have to mention when I send out the slides, I won't include the cartoons because I didn't get permission to, to use those. Um, Seriously, the definition, the working definition of a flood for being able to make a claim is that you've got that general and temporary condition of partial or complete inundation of two or more normally dry areas. Uh, and one of those parcels has to be your property. The other parcel could be your neighbors. It could be the, the, the right of way for your road, but it has to be on two. Um, properties, or if you're in a rural area, it's uh, two or more acres. And it needs to be the overflow of inland or tidal water. So it's a lake or a river or a pond that the water rose up enough that it's entering your building and flooding you. Or it can be that unusual and rapid accumulation of runoff from any source. So you get a really big intense rain and the water comes down and you're in a low area. You don't have to be next to a lake or a river, but you're in a low area where too much water came down too fast and you get flooded over land. Or in some of the examples in the trainings, they talk about uh, maybe a community service vehicle backed up and knocked over the fire hydrant or you had a water main break and it flooded an area. Well, that's another example of an unusual and rapid accumulation of runoff from any source. Um, mud flow also is listed as a, a situation that can be a claimable situation. Uh, mud flow is defined as a river of liquid and flooding, flowing mud, and, but it's more like chocolate milk or Ovaltine or whatever, it's, it's kind of thick, but it's still able to flow. But it does not include landslides. And here's a great photo from Brownsville area. There were big problems with line, landslides uh, a few years back and got this great picture of, unfortunately for, for this homeowner, um, that would not have helped them to have flood insurance. So what is covered in the building? If you've got the building coverage, it's these things that are in green. It's the, the structure itself and anything that is attached to the structure. So in the basement, um, any of the areas that are below grades considered a basement or enclosure, it does show that the furnace, the water heater are covered among the things that are covered. Let's see, for contents, all of your stuff that's not attached to the, to the walls is covered in the upper levels. In the basement, it's very limited coverage for, for contents, but washer, dryer, freezer with the food included. A lot of the things that typically really get flooded and damaged in a basement are covered by flood insurance. Sometimes people give flood insurance a bad rap for basement coverage, but it, you, your furnace, your water heater, those are some of the things that are most often damaged when you do have the basement flooding. The red shows what is not covered by flood insurance. 
So your stuff in the basement, your contents in the basement, stuff that's outside, it's not part of the main building. Your auto insurance is is separate. About 10% of the, or up to 10%, I believe, of the, the coverage can go toward your main accessory structure, which is they're showing the, the detached garage here in this example being covered by the building coverage. And, oh, I'd like to note the uh, backup policy. That's not covered by flood insurance. It can be a rider on your home hazard insurance, something to really think about for sewer backup, um, pump, some pump failure, those kinds of things. Oh, and a reminder that oftentimes the lenders and agents, you don't understand, people aren't clear that when they're getting flood insurance because it was mandatory, a lot of times the the agent will quote just the building coverage and may not emphasize that getting the contents coverage is separate and you have to choose to get that. So a very high percent of the buildings that have been in the mandatory purchase area, they just get building coverage. And then after a flood, they're mad because None of their stuff got covered when they go to make their claim, only the damage to their building, and nobody told them that they had to get the contents covered separately. So a reminder to you guys at the community level, the more we can do to, to educate folks, the better, because there are a lot of people that were upset after big floods that they did not have their stuff covered and didn't have the contents coverage. PRPL is a preferred risk policy that basically has gone away or just a few left that are getting renewed. But it used to be that you did have contents and building coverage um, together in that old policy. But now with all the new policies going forward, they are separate. But on this slide, kind of talking about some of the same things that are in the graphic but it gets into a little bit more detail on things that are excluded, like you know the precious metals, things that you caused the problem because you allowed the moisture to turn into mold and mildew, and uh, things that you basically, if you cause the damage, you don't get to get uh, make a claim on that. And I'm not going to get into a lot of details on the claims process, but did include this slide talking a little bit about the steps in the making a claim and getting payment. And uh, see, I think I've got, oh, well, yeah, I had another cartoon here. No, your flood insurance doesn't pay if you're flooded with junk mail and catalogs. But uh, toward the end, I think I've got some great resources that get more into the claims process, a link to the claims handbook and other resources on the FEMA site for the claims process. And the you get into some unique situations like uh, flooding in progress or where you've got flooding on a lake where it stays up for a really long time. And that's a situation where we've, we've had James come and help me present at homeowner associations on some of those big lakes where that's a, a concern throughout the state. So those are kind of specialties where we get into details that we won't cover today. I do want to talk about flood insurance versus disaster assistance, because as I mentioned when talking about some of the myths, people do think that they don't need to get flood insurance because FEMA is going to come in. They hear on the news about how FEMA is coming in after big disasters and helping people. And the perception is that FEMA comes in and moves you into a trailer and um, helps you pay for all the repairs and does all these things that that's not the way it happens. Now, we talked about how you can make a claim when you've got a policy, if you've got the two or more properties flooded and it's overland flooding. Um, oh, and another thing I meant to mention is that if your main flooding issue is seepage or groundwater, that is not something that's covered by flood insurance. And that is a question that comes up once in a while. But back to the difference between flood insurance and disaster assistance. For you to even be able to get any kind of assistance during a disaster, it has to be declared as a federal disaster, presidential disaster. And those are only the bigger of the, the, the floods and the disasters. 
So definitely a, a good portion of the flooding that we see in the state doesn't hit the trigger for a national disaster. In Minnesota, we do have a trigger for state disasters, and that does help with a lot of the uh, infrastructure and the public assistance side of things, but you need a federal disaster for individual assistance to, for there to be any aid for homeowners and business owners for the flooding. Uh, and when they're giving out that assistance, it's a last resort thing. First, they'll look at, do you have insurance? Do you have flood insurance? Does it cover this damage? Are you eligible to get an SBA loan? If you are, you're, they're gonna give you the loan and that's something that's gotta be paid back. You can get that loan. And then if you're not eligible for, for an SBA loan and you don't have any other coverage, then FEMA's got small amounts of money, up to 30 some thousand is gets adjusted each year, but it's in the 30,000 range to help make things somewhat livable and make some repairs, but it's a very small amount. And typically it only works out to about 5,000 to uh, maybe $10,000 range that people get. And so it's not a lot of, of, of aid and it's certainly not gonna make you whole again. So moving on here. So in our quick guide, we have a couple graphics that are kind of related to this, showing how we have had federal disaster declarations throughout the state. But if you think about from 65 through 2017, that this time period is, is showing that that's not many times that they got federal de disaster declarations. Uh, when you think about the, the many times that people might have had localized flooding. And this includes the public uh, assistance. So it doesn't show the individual assistance numbers of times that they've been, that there has been public or um, federal disaster declarations. So it's not real common. And this graphic shows the cost of flood insurance per year versus repaying a disaster loan if you end up getting the SBA loan during a disaster at or after a disaster. And this is a, a FEMA slide that James had used in an earlier presentation. And hey, James, uh, I, I believe these were the most expensive uh, disasters in the region. Is that what these were representing? Uh, just flood disasters. So flood disasters over the last 25 years. Okay, thanks. So all of those bigger flood disasters, this shows, and I'm circling the Minnesota ones, this shows the uh, what the average claim was that people made who had flood insurance versus the amount of individual assistance grant that they got, that, uh, that small amount of aid that could possibly be available if there is an individual assistance declaration. But you'll see a lot of these, there were no individual assistance claims and we've only had individual assistance declaration once in about the last 20 years. So people shouldn't think that they're gonna get help that way. So the rest of the time here, we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at how premiums are determined. And I think most of you are, have heard that we started risk rating 2.0. So FEMA's previous way of, of doing the ratings for what the cost of policies is, has changed. As of October 1st, 21, all the new policies were using the new system. And if it was to the advantage of someone who was renewing, they could use the new, new rating system. But then starting April 1st last year, all policies that were getting renewed were using the new system, using the risk rating 2.0. So here in another month, we won't have any policies left that are rated under the old system, although there are some glide paths for many of those properties that had previous policies. And at a high level, a lot of things have stayed the same. As mentioned earlier, we're still using those maps for figuring out what's 
where do we have mandatory flood insurance? Those maps are still being used and they're still being used by your communities for enforcing your floodplain regulations. But in the past, those maps were key in deciding what the rate was. And those maps are not used for determining the rates anymore. The uh, premiums increases. There is a cap that was in the federal law uh, back in 2014 with the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act. They've set a cap at the increase couldn't be more than 18% a year for um, basically for residential primary residential buildings and up to 25% per year for like second homes and non-residential buildings. So that cap is still there. And there's some were some other statutory discounts and they're getting phased in to the full risk rates that are now applying under risk rating 2.0. So they still are getting some benefits from those other discounts. And I, I mentioned the newly mapped discount. Some of those are still there, but many of those are on a glide path at that 18 or 25% a year until they get to their what their rating would be if they were rated with the new system. Um, mentioned earlier about the community rating system, that there's discounts. They still continue to get those discounts, but the good news is, is that it will apply to all policies, not just those in the high risk mapped areas. And another benefit is that people can still transfer their better rates that they have. They're kind of grandfathered in rates when they're um, changing ownership, if they're selling the property, they want to make sure that they do that properly so that the new owner can get the benefit of discounts that are still phasing in to the full risk rates. And many of the fees and charges, surcharges are not changing. There's a reserve fund assessment. There is a surcharge of $25 for primary residential, $250 for the second homes and non-residential, that's still there. And there's other fees that get added. But the main thing here is that in the past, they had to have an elevation certificate if they were in the special flood hazard area and they got rated differently. Now they don't have to have an elevation certificate in that high hazard area or anywhere, but they can choose to use one if it will make their policy cheaper. And outside of the special flood hazard area, there hadn't been a, a requirement for the elevation certificate and there were flat rates that were fairly inexpensive in the past. But now they're not using that map to, to make those determinations. All the zones are treated the same. The elevation certificate's not required. And as I mentioned before, outside the SFHA, the banks have the prerogative to require flood insurance even if the building's not in there. So the choice is for someone to go look for a different lender, but usually they find out a little late in the process. So I mentioned these preferred risk policies. They're, they were bundled with building and contents together. And once you added the fees and surcharges, it ranged from 200, about 700 a year, depending on how much coverage they had, those are no longer available. And so you're going to see the buildings are all rated based on a whole bunch of different new factors. And previously, some of the main factors that they looked at were the zone on the map, if they were in that high risk area. And if they were in the high risk area, they looked at what, what was your flood elevation and what was the lowest floor compared to that flood elevation. They did look at the types of foundations and they did look at, again, the lowest floor compared to the base flood elevation if they were in the mapped areas. But now they've got a whole bunch of different factors that they'll be looking at. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on these. Um, FEMA does offer quite a few more detailed uh, trainings, getting into these details, if you're interested in knowing more about them. And we have had 
articles in Water Talk and and um, other places like that where we get into more details on some of these nitty gritty here. One of the things that happens is the agent will put that address in and FEMA's got a rating engine that behind the scenes, it's looking at where is that building compared to the flooding source? How high above the flooding source is it? How high is it above the surrounding ground? So is it a low area where you might get stormwater flooding or urban flooding kinds of flooding? They look at a lot of different flood frequencies. So not just that 1% annual chance flood. They'll look at the maybe the two year and the 10,000 year. They, they've, they've got a lot of proprietary data that they're using now to figure out what the risks are. They also look at things like the value of the building and the type of construction, because that can make a difference on how much damage you get with a given amount of flooding. And they are looking at whether it's behind a levee or not. Um, and as I mentioned, the low areas or urban flooding could make a difference. So they're getting away from the cliff effect. On the old system, someone who's just barely inside the floodplain could have a premium of like $5,000 and the similar situated neighbor who's just outside, just barely above the flood elevation, they had a much cheaper policy because they could get that preferred risk policy. But now they'll be looking at each individual building in terms of the risk. And you shouldn't be seeing those kinds of cliff effects. And they do look at, for us, it's mainly going to be the riverine, the inland kinds of flooding. But up on the Great Lakes, they do, they will be looking at sp some special ways of looking at risk on the Great Lakes. So again, the old system was that they looked at the base flood elevation compared to the lowest floor. And the higher you were above the base flood elevation, the better rate you got. Now they're looking at your lowest adjacent grade compared to the first floor elevation. That's the first floor above the grade. So it is looking at things differently. And how do they figure out those, those elevations? They either use that rating system or you can provide an elevation certificate. And many cases, it does make a difference from what we're hearing from people around the country providing an elevation certificate does help provide a, a bigger discount in the ratings for the uh, premiums. Of course, the first floor height makes a difference. And oh, and here I was just talking about the difference between figuring out that first floor height is going to be rating engine, or you can use the elevation certificate. And a reminder that elevation certificates still are used for other purposes, and you still if it's a new construction, your community is still requiring either an elevation certificate or some other kind of elevation documentation. And they can still be used for other purpose like uh, getting a letter of map amendment. Or if a community is in the community rating system, they're supposed to be using elevation certificates. So they're not going away. You can also, on the elevation certificate, there's an option for people to measure the distance between their first floor to their lowest adjacent grade. And when the future new elevation certificate com comes out, we're pretty sure it's gonna have a new section that is aimed at making that option a little easier to understand and know is an option where you can do the measuring and not have a, um, a certified, a licensed surveyor or professional engineer do the measurements. And we have an info sheet about that available. They're looking at the cost to rebuild and gets into a lot more detail about that. But the general idea is that think about a more expensive home versus a cheaper home. They get a foot of water on them. Well, of course, that expensive home is going to have a lot more damage and get make it get a bigger claim. So the the ratings now take that into consideration and Basically, you shouldn't have the smaller homes subsidizing the bigger homes by having a more fair amount that people are paying for their flood insurance when they've got that bigger, more expensive home that costs more to repair. And there's different occupancy levels. Uh, the frame that you've got, if you've got wood versus masonry brick, of course, if it's masonry and brick, then 
you're less likely to have flooding damage. They're looking at all these different foundation types for figuring out the rating. Uh, they do look at what level of the floor you're on now in, in buildings, and that makes a, a difference in the rating. And it used to be that the first $6,000 of coverage, you were paying a much higher rate for the coverage of that first $6,000. So if you were only getting 60000 in coverage, you were paying a, fair, a, a very high amount relative to someone, at least for the amount of coverage, who was getting a bigger uh, policy, like for the 250000 So, and this just shows how in the old tables that the first 60000 there were much higher rates for that given amount of insurance. So that was an area that was saw, seen as another area of equity. Prior claims will be considered now, uh, but you get one forgiven. Again, this gets into the weeds here, so I won't go into detail, but just be aware that prior claims do start to be a factor, whereas they haven't been in the past. And we talked about the broader range of kinds of events, but there are some ways to reduce your costs, elevate your utilities, install openings, um, be in the community rating system. If your community has a lot of, of policies, especially, be good to talk about. And um, I don't remember if I saw Barrett on here or not. I know Jordan was just asking some questions about getting in the program. So we'll follow up on that because there's a lot more of our communities, I think, that will benefit from being in the community rating system here now. But you can get credit by elevating your machinery and equipment to the upper floors. Moving it up from the basement to the next floor above is probably pretty reasonable, unfortunately. If you just got one level, you got to move it to the attic and that gets pretty problematic. Flood vents, you don't have to be in the, the map zone to get benefit for flood map, for the flood vents, although it's a more limited uh, discount that you get for those. So just ending with some resources that will be in the slides that we'll send out here. And we can go ahead and turn off the recording and see if there's any additional questions.